Okay, so this week we're following on pretty much like I, I said in the WhatsApp group to, to watch last week. This week we're following on directly from last week's conversation. So last week if you were here, and if you weren't here, a bit of a reminder, it was a conversation between the Lord Jesus Christ and the woman in Samaria. He had gone in to meet this woman at the well, and, and we'd had this conversation, this evangelistic conversation where the Lord um, tried to reach this woman in, in three different ways, really. The first one, he, he uses the physical elements around her. She was there to get physical water. He uses the physical elements to show her her need for a spiritual water, for a spiritual fulfillment. The second one was through her conscience. The Lord directly said to her through supernatural power, I know without having seen you or met you before, I know that you have had five divorces and that the man you are currently sleeping with and being with and living with is not your husband and you are actually living a life completely contrary to the God whom you worship, to his statutes and the way he would want you to live. You're in a sinful lifestyle. And he did so with love and respect. He didn't do so with condemnation and hate, but he did confront her on her sinful lifestyle. And we comically, I guess in a way, you could say comically, saw the woman. That was the shortest part of the conversation. <laughs> when he addressed her conscience, after that she went, wow, you're a prophet. Anyway, about worship on mountains and completely changed the subject. And then the third way he tried to reach her was indeed through the very topic she tried to take it down. She tried to kind of get out of it using an interpretation battle. Well, you're Jewish, I'm Samaritan, you say worship there, I say worship here. What she tried to pull was the denomination card. Well, you believe this and we believe that and we're a different denomination, we're a different people. So do you know what? Let's wait until the Messiah comes and he'll tell us what we need to know. And Jesus, once again, through the third course of conversation with her, shuts that down completely. Shows her that neither the Jewish mountain nor the Samaritan mountain will be the ones we worship on. But out of both groups will come true worshippers who worship God in spirit and in truth. And we finished last week with verse um, 26. And she said this, the woman at the end of the conversation, realising that she couldn't get anywhere in this, realising that every turn she tried to take to avoid her own conscience wasn't working, said to the Lord, well, do you know what? I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. So she finishes by saying, well, you know, all your opinions, all your interpretations, your supernatural ability to know about my sinful life, let's just wait until the Christ comes. Let's just wait until the Saviour's here. And the Lord turns around at the end of verse 26 and says, I who speak to you am he. He reveals himself to this woman as being the Christ and says, you're saying let's wait for the Messiah. He's standing right in front of you. And from that point on, the woman has nowhere else to run. She now has a choice to make. Accept the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah confronting her own sinful life and turning from her sins and, and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting and following him, or running away from that well and pretending it never happened. That's the choice she now has to make. And what we're going to see here is the choice she did indeed make. So before we get into it, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are Alpha and Omega. You are beginning and end. You are the only true God in this world. You are creator of heaven and of earth, Lord. There is nothing that is impossible for you. What is impossible for us is possible for you. And although, Lord, up against your creation, this may seem like a small thing, it's impossible for me to touch the lives of these people here today. It's impossible for me to open ears and eyes, hearts and minds. It's impossible for these words to mean anything to them to shape them or change their lives, it's impossible unless you make it possible. Lord, I need your help today. We need your help today. Because unless you build the house, the builders build in vain. So Father, I just pray, Lord God, that you would be building here today. In the lives of those who know you and in the lives of those who don't, I pray, Lord, you would do a work here today. We ask for this in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So please turn to verse 27 of chapter 4 of the Gospel of John. And let's start. This is what it says. So remember, continuing on 
directly from having finished a conversation with the woman. Just then, his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. So the disciples have gone into what is known as ancient Shechem, or Sychar as it's now known, the capital of the Samaritans. And the disciples are coming out of that city, and they're coming up to the well, and they've gone to get food. The reason Jesus was left there by himself is they've gone into this city to get food, to get lunch, to get whatever, to help the, the group they are as they're traveling to eat. Something that, by the way, I'm sure the disciples must have resented quite a lot, because as being devout Jewish men, they were smack bang in the middle of a place that, as we discussed last week, any devout Jew would never walk through Samaria, let alone talk to Samaritans. It would be seen as unclean. It would be seen as detestable. They were actually seen as more unclean than Gentiles. So for, for these disciples to go into the town and get food would have been something that they most probably very much struggled with to be talking to these Samaritans and buying things from them. But they come back and it says straight away that they marveled that he was talking with a woman. Now, we talked a bit last week about the very stout rabbis who, if their mother, their daughter, their sister was in the street with them, they wouldn't talk to them. They wouldn't be seen to associate with women, even of their own relation, even their own wife, they would ignore in public because it was so unclean to be seen doing so. So the disciples come back and they're not just marveling that he's talking to a Samaritan, it doesn't say Samaritan. It says they marvel that he's talking to a woman. They can't believe it. What are you doing, Lord? That's just not what we do. That, you're now unclean. That's just not good, right? But I love what it says afterwards. and It just shows the respect and the reverence that Jesus oozed out of his life. It says, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking to her? So basically, the disciples weren't about to confront Jesus on what he was doing. They may have thought these things in their heart, thought these things in their minds, but they weren't about to tell Jesus, hey, what do you think you're doing? What are you playing at? You shouldn't be talking to her because Jesus was their rabbi. He was their Lord. He was Jesus Christ. And so they don't confront him, but they certainly do think it in their hearts and minds. And we would be foolish to think that Jesus didn't know that they were thinking it. Of course he knew that that was what was in their hearts and their minds. He was teaching them through the way he lived. And I just want to very quickly, as we move on, very quickly point something out, that Jesus taught his disciples greatly through his words, but he taught them no less and no more through the example that he set. The way he lived was just as much a lesson to the disciples as the lessons he taught them from his mouth. In fact, the way he lived only backed up the lessons he taught them from his mouth. And just a bit of a note, because today is going to be very heavy on evangelism, godly living is a type of evangelism. The way you live can speak to people just as much as what you say. And sometimes, if done wrong, what you say can mean nothing if it's completely contradicting of the way you live. So bear that in mind with your evangelism. If you think, I've got to tell them, I've got to tell them, you have got to tell them, but you can also at the same time show them through, your, through the way you live through that godly living. And Jesus here was given an example to the disciples, not just in word, but also in action. Now it says here, so the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Now the Bible doesn't include things for the sake of it. It doesn't not include things for the sake of it. There's no wasted words. The Holy Spirit has inspired each and every letter to be in scripture for a purpose. I believe that wholly and truly. And it's not leaving this in by accident. It gives us a description that the woman left her water jar. That's there for a reason. The Bible is trying to tell us something. Bear in mind, this woman has come at the heat of day by herself, which as we talked about last week would have been very unusual. She was an outcast of an outcast society because of the lifestyle she was living. And she came to get water. She was thirsty. Her mouth was dry. She was dehydrated. She wanted some water. She needs it. Human beings, three, four days without water, they're dead. 
So she's travelled potentially miles to get to this well, has to carry the bucket all the way there, carry the bucket all the way back. And after having talked to Jesus, having had this discussion where Jesus says, I know you want this physical water, but then you're going to thirst again. I can give you water that lasts for eternity. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit, to which you will never thirst again. And the woman leaving her, her bucket, leaving the very thing she's going to collect the physical water with, is a sign here that something's touched her heart. She's completely forgotten about the physical reason she was at that well, put aside the whole point of her being there, and has gone back to Samaria to do one thing. And she may not realise this at the time, evangelise. Really kind of accidentally evangelising, really. But she's gone back to evangelise. So for me, when we have a look at this lady's heart and what's happened to it, already we're seeing something has changed from the fact that she didn't say, okay, wait a minute, let me just get some water out, let me just get the water, then I'll make my way back to the city. She leaves the water, she leaves the bucket, she goes back to her city, and what's the first thing she starts doing? I think I've just met the Christ. Something in this woman's heart has changed. She is not the same woman she was when she arrived at the well that day. Something has changed inside of her afterwards. And she says to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. I love this bit. Now, we started off by talking about the three conversations Jesus had had with her. It was one conversation, but I split it into three because it's three different subjects, three different subject areas they, they tackle in the conversation. And the area where Jesus confronted her sinful lifestyle was by far the shortest part of the conversation. He said, go get your husband. She said, I have no husband. He said, you're right, you've had five husbands and five divorces, and now you're sleeping with a man who's not your husband. And she went, you're a prophet, let's move on. It was the shortest part of the conversation. However, when she goes into the city, when she starts telling people about the Lord... Is it the living water she talks about? Is it the interpretation of mountains? She tells them, he confronted areas of my life that no one knew about. She goes off the very thing that she tried to avoid in the conversation, which was how the Lord tackled her conscience. He told me all that I ever did. He revealed to me my own sinful lifestyle. He told me all that I had ever done. And then she finishes off, can this be the Christ? Now, some people have said here that she wasn't showing genuine faith, because if it was genuine faith, she would have said, this is the Christ. And I can understand where you're coming from. But when she says, can this be the Christ, there is faith in that. <laughs> because she's almost convinced herself, she's asking the question as if to say, I, I, I think I've just found him. I think the Christ, the saviour of the world, is up by that well right now. And I've just had a one-to-one -one conversation with him. So there is an element of faith here. And what's amazing and what happens, which, which happens next, is quite incredible, is it says they went out of the town and were coming to him. Now this is amazing for two reasons. One, it's amazing because of the work of the Holy Spirit and how quickly people began to pay attention. But the second reason it's amazing is because these are the same people that outcast her. And for those of you who are thinking, Aaron, where does it say in the Bible that she was outcast? Where does it say that she was pushed out of society? We know that because of the time she was at the well and the fact she was by herself. Very quickly, once again, a bit of a recap. At this time in this culture, even in other stories in the Bible, women would always travel to the wells in groups and they would never, ever go at the heat of day. They would always go early in the morning when it was at its coolest, sometimes later in the evening when it was at its coolest. But they would never go at lunchtime when it was at its absolute hottest. This lady was by herself and she was there at lunchtime. And the fact that she had had so many relationships, the fact that she had had so many marriages in this culture was an incredibly dishonourable thing. It wasn't a good thing at all. It's not a good thing today, according to the Bible, but according to this culture, it was even worse. Our culture is very accepting of things today. Back then they weren't. So the fact she was by herself tells us as well that she was pushed out from her own society, a society that was already outcast by the Jews. But what I love, like, what I love about this is, is God brought this woman to the well 
to meet her saviour. The woman, having met her saviour, goes into Shechem and brings others to meet their saviour. <laughs> Do you know one of the true evidences that someone has truly come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? A desire to share it. Imagine the Bible says, hey, I have good news for you. And someone says, yeah, I understand the good news, but I'm not going to tell anyone. You haven't really understood the good news then, have you? You haven't. One of the strongest evidences of true living faith in a person's life is a deep desire to share it with everyone. Because it's literally salvation. <laughs> if you understand the implications of the gospel, then in your heart you'll understand the importance of telling people the good news. So what is, what is the indication that this lady truly has had a transforming faith implanted in her heart? What's her first reaction? To leave behind all of her physical needs, to run to Shechem and tell the very people who have pushed her to the side, you need to come and meet the Saviour. You need to come and meet Christ. She's an awesome evangelist. She's only just started. Man, I wish I was this type of evangelist when I first got saved. She brought a whole city out to meet Jesus. I talked to like one person. I was like, yeah, I've done a really good job this week. She brought a whole city out. She'd done it the same day as well. It's incredible. Let's carry on. It says, meanwhile, so now she's in the city. She's going around the city. She's telling people, come and see this Christ. Come and see who I think is the Christ. And it says, meanwhile, while this was happening, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Who got my rabbi a takeaway? How dare they? All that time in Shechem for nothing. What's interesting here, and I, I, I like the parallel here. These Jewish men would have struggled big time to be in Samaria. This was an unclean place full of unclean people. And if you want to understand the background of that, have a look at last week's sermon. We went into detail in the, the, the history of the Samaritans and why they were viewed how they were viewed. But the disciples would not have enjoyed being there. And I know you might say, but Aaron, that's a bit of an assumption. It's not an assumption. These were devout Jewish men. Some of them were John the Baptist's disciples. These were devout Jewish men. They would not have wanted to have been in that place. And they would have looked down on the Samaritans an awful lot as people beneath them. But do you know what's amazing about this? The woman, when Jesus said to her about the living water, said, well, where is this living water? Give it to me so that I'll never thirst again. She only saw the physical element. She didn't see the spiritual element. But guess what? His very disciples made the same mistake as the woman. They were no better in their understanding. They were no better in their knowledge. He said, I have food of which you do not know. And they said, who's fed him? He said, I've got living water that you need. And she said, give me a drink. They were no better off. They understood no more about Christ than she did at this very time. In fact, I'll go one step further. I would actually say at the end of this, she understood more about Christ than them. How incredible is that? At this point in time, this Samaritan woman knows more about Jesus than the 12 disciples do. That's pretty incredible, right? And there they are looking down on the Samaritans and looking down on her because she's a woman. It says the disciples said to one, one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus then explains to them this food he is talking about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus says, what feeds me, what drives me, what nourishes me is doing the will of my father in heaven. That is what feeds me. That's what nourishes me. That's what keeps me going. And even though he was exhausted at this well, when he first got there, it says that Jesus was weary. He was exhausted, most probably thirsty and hungry. Doing the will of God has overridden all of those physical qualities. Because to do the will of God is what is absolute priority to the Lord. But I want you to notice something that he does say to the disciples you don't know about this food. At this present time, Jesus says to the disciples, 
you don't know what it is to do the will of my Father. Of this food, you don't know. You've never tasted it, and you don't understand it. Once again, please remember, the disciples were with him for three years. And a lot of what they were taught only became true in their hearts and their minds after Jesus had resurrected, especially at Pentecost. A lot of the things that Jesus said came back to them after his death. And they spent much of their time with Jesus over the course of that three years not understanding. Many of them, even up right up to the end, thought that Jesus was going to be the type of King David who was going to conquer the Romans and free Israel. And we know that because when he died, what did they do? Mourned. If they had understood what his death meant, they would have celebrated. But they mourned because they didn't understand. They thought, we've just lost our saviour. We've just put three years into this guy. We followed him, we called him Lord, we called him Christ, and he's dead? Now what? Many of the disciples did not fully understand until afterwards. Even when John the Apostle went into the tomb to see the risen Christ gone, he was the first in there. It says when he saw it empty, then the words of Christ came to him about the resurrection. It was only when he was in the tomb and saw it empty that then he realised So as we read through the Gospel of John and we see many conversations between the disciples and Jesus, don't be surprised. These men are not yet the apostles of Christ. At this present time, they are the disciples. Jesus is making them into the apostles. Making them into the apostles. And he says that they do not understand, they don't know what it is to do the will of him who sent Jesus. They don't know what it is to do the will of the Father. And I just want to quickly make something clear, and it may seem like a bit of a confusing statement. I'm going to try and explain it as best as I can. There is a difference between being in the will of God and doing the will of God. I'm going to try and explain this. Pharaoh in Egypt, according to Romans chapter 9, we are told was doing only what God willed him to do. But Pharaoh, in his heart, wasn't out of reverence, respect and love, saying, I'm going to do what my father's will is in heaven. So Pharaoh was in the will of God, the sovereign plan of God for creation, but Pharaoh was not out of his own love for Christ, out of his own desire to do the right thing, doing the will of God. So the disciples right now are in the will of God, but Jesus says you do not yet know what it is to do the will of God. You do not yet know what it is to obey the Father and do what he tells you to do. You do not yet know. He carries on and says to them, do do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Now, this is a, a proverb at the time of this, of this culture, which I'm going to explain to you. When he says, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest, he says, you guys use this proverb, and this is what the proverb means. You've still got four months. The harvest isn't here yet. Don't rush. That's what the proverb means. The proverb basically means, don't worry about it, guys. We've got four months till harvest. Chill back, relax. Harvest will come in four months. We've got plenty of time. We've got plenty of time. Relax. Jesus turns around and says, no. Jesus says, you say this proverb, but I tell you that it's completely the opposite of that. Because look what he says next. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. The proverb says we have four months left. Don't worry about it. Jesus says the harvest is now. Not four months, four years, four weeks, four hours, four minutes. It's now. It's ready now. And just a really interesting point for you, which I I love specifically. He says to them, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes. Now, please remember, at this moment, crowds of Sumerians are coming towards the well. They are leaving the city, coming up towards him to hear from him. And Jesus says to the disciples, look up, look up, look who's coming. 
the fields are white for harvest. These people who are making their way to the well right now, they're ready. They're ready to receive salvation. They're ripe. They're ready to be reaped. Look up. This is the work I'm going to give you. This is the work. You remember what he said to Peter, the fisherman? Not the theologian, the fisherman. <laughs> he said to him, you fish for men. You fish for fish. I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to make you reapers of people's souls for the kingdom of God. Look up. The fields are white for harvest. And it's a beautiful thing because remember they're looking at Sumerians. These disciples are looking at people they would never associate with. But Jesus breaks down all racial barriers, all cultural barriers. The Bible says there is no longer Greek or Jew. There is no longer male or female. All are equal in Christ. We live in a world that is desperate for equality. Do we not? Would you not say that's true? Do we not live in a world that campaigns and protests and continually, continually, continually talks about equality? Well, I tell you here today that true equality can only be found in Jesus Christ. You can protest till the cows come home. You can do all the campaigning you want. You can sit on the side of streets and post on Facebook, do all that great stuff. I'm telling you right now, equality will never be found unless Jesus Christ is in the center of it. And where Christians have misunderstood is we see a difference in authority and then think that's a difference in equality. No. We all have our roles to play. Everyone has their different roles to play. One's a pastor, one's an evangelist, one's a teacher, one is a minister, one is a, a, a missionary, one is a worker of miracles. But regardless of the position of authority, all are equal in Christ. So these disciples are once again learning a valuable lesson here. They're seeing these despised people coming towards them and Jesus is saying, these are the fields, these are the fruit, reap them. These are the people you despise, but these are the people I love and I came. And I like what it says at the end. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. He says the one who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life. So Jesus tries to encourage his disciples to evangelize in three ways. The first way, he says the fields are white for harvest. They're ready. I'm telling you they're ready. Go out. The second way, he says you're going to receive a reward. You're going to receive a wage for what you do here. For the diligence and devotion that you personally put into sowing and reaping, based off that, you will receive a wage for what you do. The wage is not salvation. Salvation's in Christ, but the wage is a reward. And each will receive depending on what they did in terms of sowing and reaping for the kingdom of God. And then at the very end, I love the last encouragement. It says that you will be gathering fruit for eternal life Jesus' last encouragement is the wages I give you last forever. Wouldn't it be nice if your jobs gave you a wage packet that lasts forever? How chilled would we all be, hey? I worked one day and now I'm sweet for eternity. Right? I'm not telling you to evangelize for one day, by the way. But I, um, the point I'm trying to make is Jesus incentivized by saying this has eternal value. So let me make something clear. It doesn't matter what career you have, what career progression you want, what contract you're fulfilling. There is no work that you will ever find more satisfaction in than doing the work of God. And there is no wage you will ever receive on this earth that has more value than the wage that God can give you for doing the work of God. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And at the very end... He says, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. There are different roles in evangelism. We do play different roles. And I have an encouragement for some of you here today, because some of us, hopefully most of us, are reapers. 
but there also may be among us, and we probably all have done our fair share of sowing. But I want to encourage the sowers in the room, because out of the sowers and the reapers, I'm going to put it out there, the sowing is harder. The sowers have to till the ground. I've done quite a bit of groundwork in my building days, and I can tell you now, digging up soft soil and digging up hard soil are two different things. (laughs) This one over here sucks. It really does. But there are people we can come across, there are people in this world who, because of their sinful lifestyles, because of what they've been through, because of how they've been raised, the soil of their lives is like concrete. And so God sends a sower to break it up. And it takes time, sweat, blood and tears, spiritually. And then they sow seeds while doing so. So the work of the sower is the tougher job. The reaper comes along and just collects the fruit. Fantastic. I remember a pastor talking about Billy Graham. Many of us know who Billy Graham was, the famous evangelist. And regardless of your opinion, I think he'd done a lot of good stuff, a lot of good work, and saw a lot of people come to Christ. Some of the people in this room came to Christ through Billy Graham. But Billy Graham was a reaper. He turned up at a city. He preached to 250,000 people, or 100,000 or 50,000. And thousands of people came to Christ. He got up. He went to another city. He didn't take them with them. He left them. Who to? The pastors, the ministers, the churches. But those thousands of people who gave their lives to Christ in that moment, do you think that was the first time? Or do you think behind the scenes there were dedicated, devoted Christian sowers who had been trying to break down those barriers, trying to sow those seeds for a long time, and all Billy Graham did was water them, and God gave the growth. Billy Graham was a reaper. And the reapers are often the ones who are seen, the ones who can be seen reaping, but the sowers are often the ones who go behind the surface and for many, many years, many months, many days are breaking up the hard ground and laying seeds. So an encouragement to you that if you find yourself sowing, it doesn't mean that there isn't any fruit attached to it. You just might not see it. Truth is, you might just not see it, but sow faithfully that one day someone else will come and reap it. And there are times, by the way, that you can be both. Sometimes you are sower and reaper. And he says, for here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 was talking about a similar thing. He was talking less about individuals and more about churches. But the Apostle Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he whose waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. So Paul just gives us a lovely, lovely, simple analogy. I can sow all the seeds in the world, I can water and water and water, but unless God moves, unless God gives growth, we do so in vain. And earlier I prayed as the, the, in, in the Psalms, if a builder builds the house without the Lord, he builds it in vain. So when we are sowing seeds, when we are reaping fruit, when we are watering, Bear in mind, it should be saturated from beginning, middle and end with prayer. Don't try and do the work of God without God, because it won't work. (laughs) I love what Paul says here, because as many of you know who may be here from the beginning, Matt Cotman planted this church. Neither myself nor Vlad had any hand in planting this church. And the pastor before me, Vlad, watered it. And I'm continuing to water it. But the only reason we have seen any growth is because God is the one who gave it. So that neither myself, nor Vlad, nor Matt, nor any of you can boast. Because it is the work of God that we have seen any growth at all. Jesus carries on. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labour. Others have laboured and you have entered into their labour. So he says to the disciples, it's a humbling fact here, by the way, you are only entering in to a work that others have been doing for a long time. Now, there's different interpretations here. I think all of them have an element of truth to them. Some say that the the labourers he's referring to are the prophets. The labour of the prophets, paving the way through prophecy, preparing the way. Some say the labourers are also John the Baptist. I completely agree with that. 
He laboured through his preaching about repentance. He laboured through baptism of water. He prepared the way for Christ. And I would actually go as far to say that our Lord Jesus Christ laboured. Did he see the fruit of his labour in his fleshly state? No. He saw it from heaven. But the fruit came after his death and resurrection. So he was labouring and sowing seeds everywhere he went. So he says to the, he says to the disciples, please don't think... This work started with you. You are taking part, you are entering into what other people have prepared, what other people have laboured for. You are joining the workforce, you're not starting the workforce. It's a humbling fact, and it's a humbling fact for us as well. God willing, we may one day see a revival in this area of North Leatherhead. I pray and hope we will. And I I pray and hope that we continue to see a revival in our own hearts and our own minds. But God forbid that day come and hundreds of people come into this church and we fall into pride thinking they only did it because DC came here. Because we in this area are new compared to the tens and twenties of people who have laboured for North Leatherhead for 15, 16, 20, 40, 50 years. We as DC are entering into this area, but we are not starting the work. We are joining work that has already taken place. It's a humbling fact. I just want to give you a much more deeper example as to this labour that we've entered into. Many of you have Bibles on your laps or Bibles on your phones, and I know some of you have it in your native tongue, but most of you have it in English. The only reason you are able to read your Bible in English today is because God used a man called William Tyndall in 1556 who died on a stake, was strangled and burnt alive for translating the Bible from Latin to English. And his last words on that stake were, Lord God, open the eyes of the king. He prayed for the very king who was killing him as he died. You and I are able to enjoy the privilege of reading our Bible in English because hundreds of years ago, God used that man to do so. But when we pick up our Bible in English, do we appreciate that? That another man laboured for us to be able to have this privilege, for us to be able to be here. And that's just one. I think of the Reformation, I think of the martyrs of Christ over the years who have made it possible in this country for us to be here like this today. We have entered in to a labour that for generations, faithful men and women have been working hard at. It's a humbling fact. And others after us, if we're still here, will enter into that labour also. It's a beautiful thing when the reaper and the sower can rejoice together. And not one think they're more important than the other. Let's carry on. Verse 39. So he's finished giving this discourse to the disciples. He's encouraging them in this field, a white for harvest, encouraging them in their evangelism responsibilities. And it carries on. It says, Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves and we know that this is indeed the saviour of the world. Wow. It says that many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what? The woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. Please, please, please never neglect to understand the importance of the testimony you have of the work of Christ in your life. Because this lady didn't understand the scriptures. She didn't have anything other than what she had just experienced with Christ to tell them. She was brand new. All she had was the testimony she just received. And that's what she took to Samaria. And that's what brought the people out. Revelation 12, 11 says, They have conquered him, talking about Satan, they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb 
and by the word of their testimony. Luke 8.39, after having healed a man, Jesus says this to them, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And the man went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. I want to correct a way of thinking that has made its way into the church. And this way of thinking is around the power of testimony. There are some people here and there are some people in other churches who hold the view that your testimony holds less power because you haven't been through so much. I'm going to correct that right now. People think that if I don't have some dreadful, horrible stories in my testimony, if I haven't been dragged through the mud, if I haven't gone to prison and killed someone and then been converted, no one's going to believe I have to have the most disgusting testimony in the world to then show the light of Christ. And what happens is when testimony, because they do exist, testimonies like that do exist, when someone shares that testimony, someone else who's had a pretty, what we would call, standard life thinks well what can my testimony do here's the problem with that pride because the person who has the very tough testimony thinks they have more power because of what they've been through your testimony doesn't have anything to do with you let's just correct that your testimony has nothing to do with you your testimony is all about how Jesus Christ saved you If your testimony is full of stories about you, it's got no power whatsoever. But if your testimony is full of how Christ saved you, how he led you, how he changed you, and then you use the stories to say, Christ changed me from this, Christ saved me from this, he led me from this, that's a powerful testimony. But every single person who calls himself a Christian here today has that same testimony. Do you think because you led a pretty normal life that Christ just had to have his hand nailed to the cross and the rest of him could just stay off because you didn't need that much of salvation? I didn't go through all the stuff they went through. I'm not that much of a sinner, so I just needed that. That was enough. No, he needed to die for you all the same, just like he needed to die for me. And if you've lived a normal life, you're still a normal sinner. Yeah? And if you've lived a terrible life, you're still a terrible sinner. Christ didn't come to save you from terrible circumstances. He didn't come to save you from normal circumstances. He came to save you from sin. And if you are a Christian here today, your testimony is you have been saved from sin. That's your testimony. You don't understand testimony if you think your testimony has to have horror stories in order to have power. There are Christian children raised in Christian homes who can share the testimony about how Christ saved them from sin because they are still sinners and it can have just as much power as someone raised in an orphanage, someone raised under abuse, someone raised under different circumstances who said, Christ saved me. Because what did Christ save him and him from? Sin. They both have that in common. So don't underestimate the power of your testimony and make sure you understand what your testimony is. It's not a story about you. It's a story about Christ saving you. I guess I'm doing something right because I'm getting a lot of amens. That's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> he told me all that I did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. Now, Jesus Christ stays in this city two days. That's a very strange thing. Once again, Samaria, it's enough just to be in its presence of Samaria. Now he stays there for two days. That's unheard of for a Jew to be staying in the city of Shechem for two days. And what I love here is what they say to the woman. We believed because of your testimony. But now, now we believe because we've heard him ourselves. It is a beautiful thing when you share the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone, when you share your testimony and you can see that God has has given them the belief, given them the faith, and they think what they, they know what you're saying is real. That's a beautiful thing. 
It's a good work you're doing when you lead someone to Christ through your testimony, but nothing will replace it when they come past you and they meet Christ for themselves. The, the Roman Catholic Church have it wrong on many different things, but they have it wrong on one big thing. The priest says, you come to me, I'll go to Jesus, he'll go to God, he'll come back to Jesus, he'll come back to me, I'll forgive you seven times, and you're all sorted. That's putting back the curtain that was ripped in two, and saying, you can't come to God unless you come through me. What's beautiful about this is these people began to come to Jesus through this woman. But Jesus then removed the woman, brought them to himself and said, here I am. Because Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. He is the only high priest between God and man. It's him you have to go to. It's him you have to go to to know the Father. And what's beautiful about this is they had had a kind of third-party belief. We believe what you're saying, but we haven't known it for ourselves yet. But now it became real. Now it became about their one-to-one -one relationship. They no longer needed the woman. And she no longer needed them. They just needed Christ. And that's not to say that as a family we don't need each other. But when it comes to your salvation because that's what we're talking about here. I'm not talking about encouraging each other or loving each other. But when it comes to salvation, you just need Jesus Christ. It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. And the last bit is quite incredible. And we know that this is indeed the saviour of the world. Just to highlight how incredible this is, not one of the disciples has made that remark yet in his ministry. Not one of the 12 disciples has come to that place yet where they have turned around to him and said, you are the saviour of the world. And these Sumerians, these people who are most despised, have stood before the living Christ and acknowledged, you are our saviour. Now, I do want to make something clear. Did they fully understand the means in which he would save them? No, they didn't. They didn't fully understand that he was going to die for their sins. They didn't fully understand he was going to resurrect. They just knew and believed that however he was going to do it, he was their saviour. And although we don't hear from these guys again, we can guarantee that when he does die and resurrect in the years to come after this, because that belief, that faith is already there, it's only cemented by the gospel of Jesus Christ, by the good news that is spread out through the land. And just to reaffirm that, in Acts, Philip, guess where he goes? Samaria. He goes back to these people. And guess what he does? Preaches the good news. And guess what happens? They accept it straight away. And they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because years before, they'd already met their saviour. <laughs> they'd already met him. They'd already met him. Now, there's a beautiful application to this. We're finishing there, but there's a beautiful application to this. And I would like to encourage my fellow Christians in the room. And I believe that this application doesn't just come from this scripture, but I believe this application has real meaning for the time we're in right now. I would even go as far to say that it's a word from the Lord himself from Scripture. And this is it. The fields are white for harvest. Now. The people are ready now. Many people think this season of COVID we've just come out of was some evil, satanic thing. And hey... I'm not about to get into that debate with you. But I do want to say this. Whatever it was for, whatever evil purposes Satan designed it for, it was a fertilizer. It was a shaking of a tree. I got a call this week from a random number. I was sitting at my desk doing work. I got a call from a random number, answered it. Hi, this is Aaron. Can I please be baptized? I'm not making this up. Sorry, who's this talking? I, I, I want to be baptized. Uh, okay. 
And after having had the conversation with this lady and her gentleman, they, they, they basically testified to me that the last three years have been such an eye-opener that they'd gone to a Bible they had in their closet, they'd started reading it, and they started, lo and behold, with Revelation. <laughs> and as they started re reading Revelation, they became more and more aware that something was missing in their life, and they went on a forum and said, we need a church, we need someone to baptize us, and they found Disciples Church, they rang me that day and said, help. I didn't go looking for them, they came looking for us. Because the harvest is ready. People are ready. They are searching for truth. They want to know what this life is all about. There's never been a time in history where people have been so ready for Jesus Christ. And we as a church, and I, it doesn't, I hope the other churches join us, but if they don't, I don't care. We as a church are going to step out into this harvest. Because what is the point otherwise? You want to come to Sunday service for the next 10 years and that's it? What's the point if we're hearers of the word and not doers of it? What's the point? These people in North Leatherhead are ready. They're ready to receive Jesus Christ. The fields are white for harvest. Jesus says the laborers are few. The harvest is plentiful. Don't blame a lack of evangelism on the harvest not being very good. The harvest has always been there. The laborers have been very few. That's the problem. The laborers have been very few. I'd like to encourage you this week, and this is where the doing of the word comes up. This is where we actually take a chance to live this out. I want to encourage you this week. I want to ask you to do something this week. As your pastor, I want to give you a mission this week. I just want you to tell one person the gospel of Jesus Christ this week. Just one. I don't want you to tell the person you talked about God on a regular basis and they already know it, you've already told them. I don't want you to tell someone you feel like turn to your neighbour and say, do you know the gospel of Jesus Christ? Okay, I've done it, I've done it, I've done it. I don't want that. I want you to tell someone the gospel of Jesus Christ and the person who's in your heart and in your head right now is probably the person you least want to. Probably the person you're most scared to. You know who God put in my heart when I was writing this? To ring my father-in-law. And it terrified the life out of me. But you know what I've just done right now? Made it that I've got to do it. Because otherwise I'm going to have about 80 people next week say, how'd your father-in-law hear it? <laughs> no, I'm just a hypocrite. I'm just a complete hypocrite. <laughs> but I'm going to ring him this week. For no reason. And I'm just going to say, Jerry, can I just share with you a minute the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it. I'm going to text you when I do it. <laughs> I'm building myself up for it right now. One person. One person. Tell them the good news this week. Tell them the gospel this week. And I guarantee you when you do, you will have a satisfaction that no food and no water in this world can ever give you because you will be doing the will of the one who sent you. And I know you might say, well, Aaron sent me. You're the one who have got to pray about it. God's spirit will give you the person to share it with. I won't. God's spirit will give you the person to share it with. And I'm going to start right now. For those maybe online or for those here who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to give a message of evangelism to those in the community and to those here who maybe aren't in the faith. And this is the message. If you're here today and you don't know God, I want you to know that God knows you. And he has known you your entire life, pursued you your entire life has loved you your entire life. And his love for you was made manifest. His love for you was shown physically in the sending of his son, Jesus Christ. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save you. To save you from the one thing in this world that separates you from your creator, separates you from God. Sin. The Bible tells us that all have fallen short all have sinned and all are in need of a saviour. I am no better than you. You are no better than me. The Bible says that salvation is a gift given to you. 
And the way you open that gift is faith. God asks nothing more of you than you believe in his son, Jesus Christ. You believe that he came to die for your sins. You believe that he resurrected, bringing you into new life. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And even greater blessing, Jesus promises that to those who believe, he will send the very spirit of God into their lives to change your heart, to change your mind, to change you from the inside out and create in you a new person. For those who believe, they receive the helper, the Holy Spirit of God. So I implore you today, if you're here today in this room or if you're online and you have yet to have given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, follow the commandment of God, believe in his Son and you shall be saved. That's what we have come to proclaim. Wherever we are, wherever we go, the good news of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I believe today's message are not just words, but I believe your spirit has accompanied them with power. And I believe the power is already filtering into the minds and hearts and souls of my brothers and sisters in this room here today. Lord, you know every single individual person you want these people to speak to. You have already told me mine, and I'm fairly confident for many here you've already told them theirs. Lord, I pray for boldness. I pray for courage. I pray for the desire to be there. I pray for your presence to join them whenever they take that step. I pray for the joy of Christ to fill them after having completed your work. Lord, I've asked them to tell one person. Lord, may it grow in the months and years to come to two, three, four, dozens, hundreds, thousands. Lord, may we be like the lady in Samaria who went to an entire city and said, I have just met my saviour. Come and meet yours. Lord, I pray for power this week as they share the gospel as good soldiers of Jesus Christ, fighting the good fight of faith. Be with them, Lord, I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.